Welcome everybody to the first session um, that will be on documentation of sexual violence. This is the first session as part of our sexual and gender based violence series and we're super excited to have Dr. Kim Griswold here from University of Buffalo, one of my beloved mentors and also one of the co direct main directors of the human rights initiative at, at Buffalo, which is our PHR clinic at UB. So Dr. Griswold, do you want to maybe introduce yourself and the topic and we can get going here. Of course, thank you so much, Victoria. And it's a real pleasure for me to be here to talk about not only the documentation and the occurrence of sexual and gender-based violence, but to talk a little bit about the PHR student-run clinics and the whole asylum network that PHR runs. And uh, you'll see as we go forward, some of the work that's been done here in Buffalo, but is being replicated across our country in terms of seeking people seeking asylum. So tonight we're gonna to talk about the, a little bit of the epidemiology of sexual and gender-based violence, and then the documentation of it and what we've done here to help our asylum seeking clients. A warning before we begin, uh, this presentation does include the slides and two videos with some explicit discussion of sexual violence, including language that can be upsetting. Please feel free to leave this presentation at any point and reach out either to me or to one of your peers or colleagues after this talk. So the Human Rights Initiative, UB, was founded in 2014, and it actually occurred because at the same time, the Center for Survivors of Torture was implemented at Jewish Family Service. And this was originally through a grant through the New York State Health Foundation, and now the Office of Refugee Resettlement funds the Center for Survivors. We, of course, as a student-run clinic, uh, working with local clinicians, are all pro bono. We, we, have, we take no money for our work, and uh, we receive nothing if we testify in court. But we, it was founded really because Buffalo is a hub, as many of you know, for refugees, there are four resettlement agencies, and for asylum seekers because of primarily Vive La Casa, which is the largest residential center in the United States for asylum seekers. Years ago, it was for people streaming into Canada, seeking freedom and going to Canada. But because that border is now closed, uh, which happened after 9-11 actually, now uh, our asylum seekers uh, live there uh, sometimes for quite a while before they find jobs or find their own places to live as they get settled and, see, and gain asylum. So the main purpose of our work is to um, provide these forensic examinations, either gynecological, which we'll be talking mostly about this evening, physical for physical scars or psychiatric, so that these testimonies and affidavits that the students scribe for and that we complete are used in immigration court in support of the case if indeed there is evidence that is found consistent with what the asylum seeker has told us. If an individual does have a forensic exam, it significantly increases the likelihood that they will be granted some form of protection. Asylum is not the only form of protection that a seeker may have. There are other sort of lesser forms, but are still protective. And this was shown in a study, a seminal study done in 2008 by Lustig and replicated just last year through um, work through PHR and other researchers, uh, 2021, showing that the people who had forensic exams, any, any one of these three kinds, uh, were much more likely to have protection. And most of them in the most recent study were granted asylum. To date, our own clinic has served 180 clients and we've done the gamut of all three of these kinds of examinations. And on the right, you can see in, um, I think this is the kind of map that you all do so well, that the bigger the uh, word, the more people is shown. Um, Victoria can correct me later if that's incorrect, but you can see that we've seen uh, a lot of people from all over the world, uh, the African continent, as well as South America. And no, that was, that was accurate, Dr. Grizzle. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm never quite sure. Um, one of the things that has made me um, so passionate about this work is learning about the people who, who do, do, on, do it on, on the front line. And I had the immense honor of hearing Dr. Dennis McQuaggy speak in 2014. PHR invited him to be the key speaker at their conference. They have an annual conference. He is an obstetrician gynecologist, Congolese, founder and medical director of the Ponzi Hospital in Bukavu, uh, DRC. He and uh, uh, Nadia Murad, who is um, from Iraq, Yazidi people, and they were granted the Nobel Peace Prize in 2018 because of their work against sexual violence and trying to heal the wounds that occur and also prevention. Uh, this is one of the videos that may be a little hard to watch at times, so please protect yourselves and turn it off if it becomes upsetting in any way. She was a young woman, around 20 years old. 
This young woman was taken by soldiers, and seven of them raped her in succession. Et après, le dernier, après l'avoir violée, a pris son arme, il a pris, mis son arme au niveau de son appareil génital, et il a tiré. On l'a amené à Panzi, où je pouvais constater qu'il avait tout l'appareil génital externe était en petits lambeaux. Et là, j'avais vu une, pour la première fois une barbarie que je ne savais pas m'expliquer. There was more to come. Dr. McQuaggy would see case after case, from very young children to elderly grandmothers, tortured with machetes, blades, sticks. Rape in the Congo had become a favored weapon of war. J'avais inauguré vraiment un petit hôpital pour pouvoir venir en aide toujours aux femmes enceintes. Et d'un seul coup, je, je me trouve aujourd'hui à me battre contre la violence qui est faite aux femmes, une violence sans nom, une violence qui est tout à fait délibérée. Dr. McQuaggy and Pansy Hospital have treated tens of thousands of patients, healing the physical, psychological, and social trauma that results from sexual violence. Alongside Physicians for Human Rights, he educates medical, judicial, and community workers so that survivors can pursue justice. By speaking out against these atrocities, Dr. McQuaggy himself became a target of violence. Armed gunmen attacked Dr. McQuaggy's home, holding his family at gunpoint, and killing his friend and security guard, Joseph Vizimano. The doctor narrowly escaped, and PHR provided a safe haven in the United States, where he and his family could recover. We are the testimonies, and there are two choices. We can decide to kill them, and at that moment, Nous sommes complices de ceux qui commettent ces actes. Mesdames et messieurs, la deuxième possibilité, c'est de parler à la place de ces femmes et dire ce que nous voyons, témoigner de ce que nous voyons, dire ce qu'elles nous disent et demander à ce que ça cesse. Despite the risks to his safety, Dr. McQuaggy and his family decide they cannot stay away. In his return to Bukavu, thousands welcome him, lining the street for miles, surrounding and protecting him for a safe return to Pansy. <laughs> Dr. McQuaggy's vision and courage have helped launch a global movement against rape in conflict zones. De ce qui s'est passé, il y a combien de temps? He is the embodiment of a physician for human rights. He hears the women and girls of Congo. He helps heal their bodies and minds by speaking their truth and calling for change. He conquers violence with justice. We stand with Dr. McQuaggy and honor his work. So um, a little bit about the epidemiology actually globally about uh, sexual and gender-based violence. This is from the, the World Bank. Um, there are many global institutions looking at this kind of violence around the world. 35% of women worldwide have experienced either physical and or sexual intimate partner or non-partner sexual violence. 38% of women globally are murdered by intimate partner violence. 7% of women globally have been sexually assaulted by someone other than an experienced female genital cutting. Uh, this is probably an underestimation because that is such a taboo subject and probably um, women, many women will not disclose. Anyone can be a survivor of sexual and gender-based violence. Um, certainly they who are uh, gender diverse, women, men, girls, boys of any age and background can be affected. 
Um, this is from UNHCR, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And when they're looking, this is from an emergency document that they uh, put out. And when they're looking to sort of seek to uh, try to solve these issues and work with communities, it's very important to involve the entire community. Um, back in the day, it was, you know, you would just work with women and uh, children, but it's very important to involve men and boys in these discussions and educations around the world. There is an increase for sexual and gender-based violence, which is why we see so many asylum seekers, because when countries are in conflict and violence um, and in emergency situations, there's a complete breakdown, not only of family, but of all of the institutions and infrastructure that support uh, families and people are forcibly displaced within a country. And people who are uh, targeted are likely to be people with disabilities, uh, people from the LGBTQI, uh, communities, adolescents, elderly, and female heads of households. And we actually see that uh, quite a bit in uh, among our asylum seeking clients. Definitions are very important for our work uh, with PHR and with immigration court. Um, we have to use sort of evidence-based guidelines when we do the work. And in a, in a little while, I'll talk to you a little bit more about the language you, we use in the affidavits. Um, Rape, we heard the other day in, in another session we were in that is sort of a legal term and there's some confusion about that. I do use the word rape in some of my affidavits, but sexual assault or sexual violence um, is also um, a little bit harder hitting. And if I want to use a word that expresses the outrage that I have or that the woman has expressed to me, I might use that term. Um, but in, in any case, in one study, it was shown that rape or sexual assault of some sort was as high as 90% among refugees and people who are fleeing violence. Okay. Um, um, female genital cutting um, is defined as all procedures that involve partial or total removal of the external female genitalia uh, or other injury to the, uh, the female genital organs. And we have seen other injuries, um, uh, uh, purposeful um, uh, cutting through. Uh, one woman we saw had um, something that was, was trying to be cut into her uh, from someone who had perpetrated violence. Forced sex work and human trafficking, we also have seen um, often with people fleeing um, through different countries, with, uh, helped by agents they're called, but they can also exact a price. And if you don't have money, sometimes the price is sexual violence. Forced marriage and cohabitation and denial of the right to contraception, abortion or termination, and measures to protect against uh, STIs. A few slides uh, more now about female genital initiation. Perpetrators are often family members. Um, it's often viewed as this rite of passage for young girls, although uh, sometimes infants are cut. So um, that is done probably for a different reason than for the initiation. Perpetrators are often the female relatives, most often the mom, grandmom, aunties, or other women in the village. Um, nurse midwives often participate. Um, and mothers may not understand uh, the dangers of, of FGC. Um, and if she does, she may not be able to help the daughter escape because um, it, it's such a strong practice in whatever community this is being done. And as we met, said before, it's meant to be very secretive. And often um, people will not even divulge to sisters. We saw one client um, who had been um, initiated and she didn't know if her sisters had been because no one would speak of it in the family. Driving factors of GC are gender inequality and patriarchal norms in many societies. Uh, traditional leaders may demand that the sons marry someone who was cut. So um, most of what I have seen of this, um, and I've you know, been doing this for, for quite a while, um, and it was the people that we used to see back in the late 80s, early 90s, um, they were mostly from Somalia. And their belief of female genital cutting was rooted in the cutting enhances fertility and sexual pleasure for men, um, that it suppressed the female sexuality so that she would be much less likely to um, practice infidelity and that it led to better hygiene. Um, and poverty also plays a huge role. Families who are unable to pay uh, for basic uh, food or costs of their own home, see this child marriage or marrying off the daughter uh, ensures her security and also the family's income. 
There is no medical benefit to female genital uh, mutilation. Um, it is mostly carried out between infancy and age 15, although we have seen women in their 20s and 30s who have been cut um, for reasons, uh, many reasons. Uh, one woman I saw, uh, whom I will never forget, um, chose to be in love with someone outside her religion and her father purposefully, uh, he himself held her down and, and she was cut so that she would stay within the family. Um, it was uh, it was an experience that, that was um, very upsetting for me and for the students that were in the room. Uh, and of course, for the woman herself, I'm happy to say she did get asylum. Regions that practice FGC concentrated in the African continent, but also prevalent in other countries, Iraq and Yemen, and it's found actually around the world. And this CDC data uh, in 2012, but as I mentioned before, um, UNHCR found that over 200 million women had been cut. Now I'm going to go over the types of FGC and what we actually document for the asylum work that we do in the affidavits. This is from the WHO definition, and we use that because, again, it's, um, you know, it's evidence-based, and in court, we want to use everything that the court doesn't have to question. It's not something that we came up with. This is something defined through WHO. Uh, type one is partial or total removal of the clitoris and or the prepuce or hood. Um, and if you want to really distinguish it, and, and sometimes we do, uh, there's a type 1A, which is removal of the clitoral hood or prepuce only, and type two, the clitoris and the hood. Uh, what you see on the right, that template, is what we use in the actual affidavit. We do not take pictures of the woman. We examine, describe, and then use this format for or the affidavit in court. Type two is partial or total removal of the clitoris and the labial menorah with, without the excision of the majora. And again, this can be brought down to other uh, types, uh, the labia menorah only, partial or total removal or total removal of the clitoris and the labial menorah, or the labia menorah and majora. Type three is the most extreme. Uh, infibulation. We do not see this uh, per se when the woman presents to us. Um, we did see one woman who had had this done, but it had been opened up. Uh, when I was seeing Somali women in the early 90s, uh, most of them had infibulation done. And at that time, Children's Hospital and gynecologists were, um, were un undoing that surgery so that she, so it was, she was opened up. Um, the problem with this is it's not only extreme and horrific, um, once it is sewn together, uh, once things are cut and it's sewn together, there's only one exit for menstrual period and urine. And you can imagine what happens and we'll see that in a few slides. Um, and this is then type 3A or 3B, uh, removal and apposition of the menorah and majora either or. So this is the most extreme. Four is classified by who is any other harmful procedure for non-medical pur purposes, um, piercing, incising, scraping. And as I mentioned before, sometimes women um, who have had violence perpetrated against them, the perpetrator wants to cut into them to show uh, what he has done. Um, we've also seen that with tattoos uh, on the woman who has been raped. But there are a lot of risks, obviously, with this procedure, as you all can imagine. Um, if it's done as an adult, there's a, or as a child, but we don't hear from the infant or child, um, it's, it's very painful. Uh, there can be hemorrhage. Uh, the artery can be cut. Um, there's swelling and infection. Many women have told us that for weeks after the procedure, if they were old enough to remember, they couldn't move and they're held in a hut um, with, with women attending them as it heals. And it's very painful to urinate. Um, People die, of course. Many women, infants and girls have died from this procedure. It's often done under non-hygienic um, situations, sometimes with blades that are not uh, you know, sterilized. And of course, the mental health and sequelae uh, after this. Um, it's interesting because some women who have had it done as infants don't really understand the, the normal female anatomy. So one of the things that we can offer as physicians and providers is to explain and normalize and help the woman understand what's happened. And I'll talk a little bit um, uh, more about that. Long-term risks, of course, are um, very prevalent. And women who have talked about this, who have had it done, um, often describe the mental health sequelae, et cetera. There can be chronic pelvic pain, uh, damage and scarring, um, chronic genital infections, 
Um, many women who have had this done um, have had UTIs that are untreated that, that lead to other problems, painful urination and menstruation. Sexual health problems are probably the first thing that, that comes to mind and is often the case. Uh, and uh, complications in childbirth if, if the woman has had an extreme version of FGC. Uh, some of the most uh, horrible things that can happen at the end, of course, are fistulas. And I'm sure that Dr. McQuaggy and his colleagues have seen many of this. Um, you know, injury to the genitalia, or if it's improperly done, there can be fistulas formed. Um, so this is a longstanding complication that requires surgery. Perinatal risks, um, sexual health problems are probably that, and mental health sequelae are most of the ones that we've, we've seen. Um, often women are reluctant to talk about this, um, particularly in our work with asylum seekers, uh, but it's important for them as much as they can to tell us uh, and I'll talk a little bit about trauma-informed care in a minute, uh, because this will be their case in immigration court. Um, if we can prove this and say it's diagnostic, um, this woman will probably get asylum. Uh, there are two vignettes here. Um, this is from um, a woman, a young girl who was 13, um, and her mother said that she was going to undergo this initiation. Um, she didn't want to do it because her friend had died of it. Um, but indeed, um, she did have it done. She didn't die, but she nearly did. Um, so, you know, even over the protestations of these young women, uh, this is done often. And uh, this, um, this is um, a, an example of someone working with indigenous women, um, shining a light on this practice uh, to show that it's, you know, it's a lack of knowledge and there are ways that we can combat this and work with communities. Um, I just wanted to tell you a few uh, anecdotes briefly. Um, when we do the work, uh, two things came up recently, which, was, which were very interesting to us in our work. I was asked to, to see a woman to document that she had not had FGC. And so I turned to PHR for a question about this. I said, we've never been asked this before. What, you know, why, uh, is this correct? Should I do this? And uh, PHR said, yes, absolutely. Because you might be able, even if she has not had it done, there may be ramifications for her daughters or for somebody else in the family. So um, uh, the good news is that we did see uh, this woman recently. Um, I don't know if Katie is, is on this call, but she was the student scribe. And uh, the case was, uh, future persecution of her daughters, that if she had to go back to her country, her daughters would be cut and she gained asylum. So she is safe and her daughters are safe. So uh, this was interesting to us. So I, I suspect we might do more of this in the future. Um, uh, the other thing that was interesting in our work with this was um, a woman who said that she had had FGC, but she had been in detention and a nurse had seen her in detention and said that she did not have it. This was at a detention center in Texas. Uh, the nurse said she had not had it done because she didn't see evidence of being sewn together. And um, when we saw her, we felt that she had had it. We actually got a second opinion because we didn't want the other uh, court to, you know, to, to uh, the, the government attorney to question. And the good news on that is that she also was granted relief uh, because she had indeed had it. So um, there are all kinds of different things that occur um, with this particular uh, form of, of sexual violence. So uh, a little bit now about the gynecological affidavit that we do. Um, the affidavits are scribed by our student scribes and there are templates for the gynecological, the physical and the psych. The interview portion is, is the same. So with every client, we do a history, the sequence of events that led up to the torture, the persecution, the cutting. Um, we need to know who did it and how many people. Often the client can't remember, uh, both because of trauma and because it's hard for them to speak of it. Um, but we always do a trauma-informed approach. We ask permission uh, before we, you know, obviously the client knows why they are seeing us, but sometimes they can't speak of it. So if we have to stop that evaluation and reschedule, we will do that. Um, we, we tell them what we're doing. We get their consent and permission. Um, with the gynecological, it's um, important to establish rapport as best you can. And so the students bring, uh, sometimes we have flowers or water or fruit um, to sort of normalize the environment as best we can. I do do a pelvic, not an, an internal pelvic exam, but external. Um, we explain this to, to the client. 
Um, I tell her everything we're doing is a little difficult when we have an interpreter, uh, but we always use a female interpreter. Um, uh, if Sometimes we've only had a man, but then sometimes we've had to reschedule that. Um, we don't really do a speculum exam at all. Um, and then when I'm describing what I saw and uh, in concert with the interview that the lady has given us, um, I focus on consistency. Now, this is one of the things that I can say diagnostic. So the consistency levels are, um, is this consistent with what she told you? What is what you see consistent? Is it highly consistent? Is it typical of? Is it not consistent? In the, in the case of FGC and, and initiation, it is diagnostic if I see it. So that's a really um, telling term to use for the court. Diagno I am diagnosing something that I have seen um, that it matches what this person has told me. And as I say, it usually uh, does mean that they will get protection. Here's an example of the affidavit um, most of the affidavits start out the same. There's the clinician's name and credentials. Um, the, it, it's all the same uh, along with the physical and the uh, psychiatric. Now, it is true that a woman who's had FGC could also have other physical, you know, physical scars or something like that. So we might do a combined physical gynecological uh, exam. Um, this is the template that I showed you before. Uh, this is the format that we use and uh, the figure is, is put into the affidavit and then the interpretation of findings is what the, the student sort of starts and then the clinician finish, finishes. Um, and we do use, as I told you, the WHO definition. And then uh, we get to the conclusions and um, you know, we go, I go through or the student goes through sort of matching what the person has said with what we've seen. Um, and then this last part, um, we have to say certain things, um, how many interviews we've conducted overall, uh, the consistency of what we see, I could say typical of or diagnostic of if I saw this, uh, my clinical opinion is said there. And then um, this statement, I declare under penalty of perjury uh, that this was done and, and executed. This is all essential for court. So some of the findings through our, um, our HRI clinic, um, our asylum seekers have originated through all of these countries that you see, uh, mainly type two and type three that we've seen. Um, we did see one person who had had the infibulation, but it had been opened up. Um, PTSD and major depressive disorder were reported for uh, almost half of, of the client sample that we saw and recurrent urine, urinary tract infections and blood retention during menstruation were the major complications that we saw in this particular group. Uh, this is the next uh, video I want to show you. It's um, fairly short. I think we're in good time. And uh, this was done actually almost a decade ago through UNHCR at their um, 60th uh, anniversary, I think. And I wanted to show this because it really shows you the resilience of people and women who have gone through violent events. And um, I think that um, it shows that side that we have to never forget how resilient these people are. Julieta Marakesoni. I'm originally from Rwanda and I was born in Burundi as a refugee. My name is Sahar. I'm 19 years old. I'm from Iraq, from Baghdad. I'm from Viabia, in Dimashq. My name is Eugenia Mena Moreno. I'm from Urabá. I'm from Urabá. I'm from Urabá. I'm from Urabá. I'm from Tunisia. In this, the 60th year of the signing of the Refugee Convention, UNHCR undertook a project of dialogues. Teams traveled to seven countries and met with over a thousand women and 200 men to talk and listen. This is some of what they heard. To grow up as a refugee in Burundi was not an easy thing because uh, in the fact that I had a card as a refugee and I was treated as a refugee and I was many times called names as a refugee. The conversations were filled with recurring themes, the need for documentation, food and shelter. I was a little girl, I didn't know how to do it, and I didn't know how to do it. 
وما نقدر نطلع لان هي ارخص شقه لقيناها بصراحه وكلش تعبانه هاي بعد الترميمات اللي احنا سويناها هم بعدها تعبانه and the need for education. The dialogues gave the women a voice, and when it was too hard to talk, they drew pictures that spoke of their worst fears. Harassment, violence, abuse, My name is Doris Berrio. I'm displaced. I'm from Colombia. Me llegaron las primeras amenazas. Me llegó una una amenaza por por escrito eh, por un grupo armado donde me decía que tenían que abandonar el barrio. Pero yo no no presté atención a esa amenaza, sino que seguí seguí trabajando por las mujeres. Other women talked about not having a right to citizenship, how they were stateless. وكانوا عاملينك شي مجرمه، وانا ماني مجرمه، انا كل مشكلتي انه انا ما معي هويه لبنانيه، وامي تجوزت انسان منه لبناني، هاي هي كانت مشكلتي، اكثر من هيك ما في شيء. But the most pervasive issue was sexual violence. One woman after another told the story of how she or someone she knew had been raped. That's three men are coming and calling my daughter. I think the women who have been raped many, many times, not even one, many, many, many times in front of their children, in front of their, their families. It's not something, it's not easy. It's not uh, something you can tolerate. But for me, I know that they suffer and I, I suffer with them. Well, the violence was more difficult and more cruel was the violation. It was something I didn't expect. So it was something, pues, something indigno, something that no woman wants to happen. The men met apart from the women. They talked of the humiliation they felt when the women and their families were attacked. The conversations revealed a shared pain, but also strength. The women pushed back and said no to fear and yes to rebuilding their lives. عندي معهد نحت تابع لليو ان مؤسسة اليو ان بالسيدة زينب بعد المقبرة من اشتغل بالنحت احس براحة يعني ارتاح من اشتغل بالنحت اطلع اللي انا اريده. I never say that I cannot do if there's something you give me Juliet please this is the work do it. I never say no. I try first and to see if I can do it. If really I see that I cannot do it, then I tell you no, I cannot do it. But I always think that I can do it. Que tienen esperanza, que tienen metas. Y si tienen hijos, pues que luchen, porque eso es lo más importante para uno, sus hijos. Ya. Que luchen hasta el final, que al final van a tener la recompensa. Y la recompensa es que los sueños de uno son sus hijos y que sus hijos sigan adelante y que que sean guerreras. I think that's such a really beautiful video that shows the resilience and how important it is for us to bear witness to, to what happens to people who suffer this violence. So how, how to move forward? Um, well, one of the ways we're doing it through, 
through our HRI and working with PHR is to provide this objective documentation so that these women can find safety and support um, and with their families. Um, as, as we said before, that it does increase the likelihood that they will be granted asylum or a form of relief. Um, so this is one way we, we can help combat misinformation, uh, understand the forces uh, underlying sexual and gender-based violence, um, avoid stigmatizing affected communities and sharing accurate information, and being advocates. I mean, I think that's one of the things that more and more we know in medical student education and we as providers, we are advocates for the people we see, um, our patients, uh, other people in the community, and it's up to us because we have the passion, the training um, that, that can really help and working with communities. Um, we need to continue to learn and to listen so that we hear from our clients and from our patients so that we can do better and to make this world a, a better place. Um, we need to be, have evidence-based uh, work so like PHR does um, so that we speak from a position of knowledge um, and learn from the people that we see. Um, I think that's the, the most important thing that, that we can do. And I think that's one of the things that so impresses me about all of you students, because you are advocates and uh, you are going to make the difference going forward in our world. Um, that is it for the presentation. Um, the next slide is the references. And of course, we're happy to send that out, I think, Victoria. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy uh, to take some now or uh, later if, if people aren't um, able to marshal their thoughts just yet. Just wanna thank you so much, Dr. Griswold for talking to all of us, educating us on this um, extremely important topic. So just grateful, thank you. You're most welcome. I was curious if you could share a little bit about kind of your own process around um, your own mental health kind of bearing witness to the survivors that you care for and any advice you have as kind of we're all developing our own mm -hmm. toolkit for um, self-care while we engage in this work in a healthy way. Right. Uh, thanks for that question, Lauren. Yeah, it, it is hard. Um, I think one of the things that uh, I find from this work is I love working with students and I love to teach. So that for me is sort of the the added benefit of doing the work, I, I want to help clients. Um, I want to be objective. I want to be the best, you know, forensic examiner I can. Uh, but I also love hearing from students and listening to them and working with them. And I think that balances my my mental health when I do the work. Um, the other thing that that balances me are, you know, just regular life, and that's a balance that all of you will have to continue to learn about through your whole whole careers. Uh, you know, medicine is consuming. And uh, listening to problems that people have and things that happen to people is very difficult. And we have the, the privilege of hearing things that other people don't hear, um, whether it's in your daily work as a physician or something like this that we do. So that, that's a lifelong uh, lesson to try to learn how to balance, you know, family, friends, uh, animals. You know, many of you know I have dogs and horses. Uh, that's a huge relief to me. It's really helpful for your mental health. Um, but, you know, you find what, what, what works for you, um, you know, eating healthy, um, exercising and trying to keep yourself healthy. But I think helping others also does give you some kind of mental health relief. Um, it, it, it's, I think one study has shown that people who volunteer and help, not in this way, but in other ways, endorphins um, are, you know, are, are, are running around because you're helping others. So I think that's some of the things that, that I find helpful. That made me uh, think about a question of like how you practice, you can't do this as a resident, right? You have to be uh, attending. You can do it as a resident. We've, we've sort of looked at that. The, the problem with that is that if they have to testify in court, sometimes the opposing attorney might, you know, attack yeah. that. But there are many residents who've had a lot of experience, you know, like before they went to medical school or during medical school. So in that case, yes, I think you have to have a license. You, know, okay. you have to be licensed to do it. So, and residents can, you know, are often licensed. Um, so it's not out of the question. We haven't really found a way to do that well here, um, but we have trained many of the residents, family med and psych, I think we've trained. So um, I know other clinics do use residents. Okay, that's great to know. And then like practically, you know, you just, 
Is it similar when you work for PHR, when we all go off in different directions that you can sign up for um, forensic evaluations in the, your local area and you can just volunteer? Okay. Uh, absolutely. And many of our students who have gone on to other institutions for their residency go right into their human rights initiative clinics there. Yep. Something to take note of when you're looking at where you want to go for residency, I guess. Yeah, right. If no one else has a question, I have a little bit more of a pointed question just because I think the response would be interesting for everyone to hear, Dr. Griswold. What have you heard from some of our attorneys about the weight of the affidavits, specifically the gynecologic affidavits for the FGC cases? They 100% uh, say that it has been helpful, uh, particularly in this case, because it's such a clear consistent pattern. You know, this is, I've used diagnostic of a couple of times with other things, phys physical things that I've seen. But when you see uh, the evidence of female genital cutting, uh, it is completely diagnostic and there's, there, there's no defense. You know, the, the government attorney, the ICE attorney can't really say it wasn't because you were the one that are testifying. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. Um, this is a pretty clear case, but other cases, for instance, uh, like rape, when, when a sexual violence has occurred and a woman has told us about that, there's often nothing seen, right? Nothing tangible that you can see um, or describe. And then as the examiner, if you testify in court, it's your role to educate the court as to why that is. Um, just because nothing is seen, it doesn't mean it didn't happen. And then you have to educate the court about um, the trauma and um, memory and trauma. And uh, you can, you know, you can cite uh, articles. Sometimes we've done that in affidavits, but really as, as the, the clinician testifying, it's your role to educate the court and they will listen. I mean, they are not, you are the medical expert, you know, when you're in the court. Um, so that I think is a real service as well. Um, there was one person I saw who uh, told me that she had been raped and that she'd been uh, taken to a hospital. She'd been bleeding. Um, I forget what country she was from. And I believed her and I wrote in the affidavit. And then I did was testifying during that case. And the judge at one point turned to me and he said, well, what would you say if I had documentation from the hospital where she went? That's how he said it. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know what? you know, I believed her or maybe he has documentation that nothing, you know, who knows. Uh, but in fact, what the documentation was uh, saying that she had, there, there was evidence uh, in that document from the hospital uh, that she had been raped and there was more evidence um, in that document. So, um, you know, it's your job to just um, do the exam objectively as you can, listen uh, to what you were told and then make a determination about the consistency. And that's all you can do is tell the truth as you, as you know it. But attorneys do want these exam, the, you know, these forensics done. Alyssa, go for it. Hi. First off, just thank you so much. That was an informative talk, as always. Um, second, I have a question regarding this FGM reconstructive surgery. So I was talking with Efrain about our upcoming event that we wanted to do. Um, I just was wondering if, like, you've heard from the clients, like, if they're interested in those types of surgeries or um, if they're ever aware of those things. Just Yes. Oh, th thank you, Alyssa, for that. For that, I was going to bring that up. Yes, um, I have discussed this with with clients, and there is uh, reconstructive surgery that's done. Uh, Marcy Bowers, Dr. Marcy Bowers, is one of the primary people that uh, do the surgery. Uh, amazing uh, physician um, in California. Um, and there's actually a Penn, Penn University of Pennsylvania, I think has a surgeon that does this. So it's an interesting topic with the woman themselves because mostly they haven't heard of, uh, of, well, number one, they may not sort of understand what's happened. Um, so part of your role is to educate about that, normalize it. We've used pictures of normal genitalia with women I've seen in the past. Um, and if they want reconstructive surgery, uh, it can be done. Now, while they're seeking asylum, probably not. I mean, they would have to get the asylum, but insurance uh, would probably cover it um, because it's, you know, it's, part of normal, it's part of correcting what was done and helping that person achieve their full, um, you know, their, their full measure of, of what they, uh, what they are, uh, do. So yes, um, but I think it would have to be brought up, um, 
probably through the primary care. I mean, you, you might mention it. I have mentioned it to, to some of the women that I've seen, uh, but then uh, we can do referrals. So any clinicians who's, do, who's doing this work would make a referral on to uh, primary care, OBGYN for further discussion. And uh, that would be something down the line that um, if you were seeing somebody, if you, if you were doing this kind of care, that you could carry that on. Great. Yeah, I didn't know that one, um, the Dr. Bauer's name, but Dr. Persek is the one that yes. I read the paper. Dr. Persek yeah, is at Penn, the, right? Penn, yeah. yeah, so that was one of the individuals we talked about having as a speaker. So yeah, great, great connection. Yeah, absolutely, yep. Any other questions? Um, I was just going to ask Dr. Griswold, first of all, thank you so much for speaking about this topic. Um, the presentation was really informative, and obviously this is so important, so thank you so much for, for taking the time. You're welcome. And I was just wondering, just in general, even outside of the context of um, asylum evaluations, how you broach this subject with um, like patients who you might be concerned are survivors of SGB or gender-based violence, um, and you know how you make them feel comfortable, how you kind of like are sensitive to different cultures and um, things like that. So just mm -hmm. general tips for how to start that conversation. Yeah, thanks for that question. Well, you know, I was lucky because uh, my whole practicing life was uh, uh, on the west side of Buffalo, uh, taking care of refugees. Um, we, I had, I was involved with two practices. We were all involved in the care. We were just down the street from Jericho Road. We all sort of started together. Dr. Glick started at, at Barton Road, and we had our practice on Grant Street. So th that was where most of the refugees were resettled there. So I had the advantage of learning from refugee resettlement agencies, uh, workers that I worked with, uh, medical students. We started a refugee health clinic night at that time. So we were sort of involved in, in learning and listening as we went. Um, and I think what that did for our the women that we saw was it, it made it a comfortable environment for them because um, that's who we saw. We had interpreters. We, we sort of tried the best we could to make it a comfortable environment for taking care of, of all of our patients. So I, I think I just sort of uh, learned from mentors and from others that I worked with. Um, and, you know, in, in primary care and family medicine, you sort of learn how to, how to get rapport going. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I love seeing people, I love listening and hearing from them. So part, partly that was part of it. Uh, and then also, you know, asking permission and letting them tell me what they were comfortable telling me. And sometimes it takes a long time for a patient to tell you something that's happened. Now, obviously if I was doing a GYN exam, um, I would go through the, you know, this is what we're gonna do and I would explain and uh, et cetera. And then, you know, if I saw something, even if she herself didn't reveal, uh, then we would have a, um, another conversation about it. Um, so I think I was just very fortunate to be in a situation where it was sort of a constant learning environment. Thank you for that question, Sneha. Any other questions, comments, concerns about the series at all? No? All right. Then we'll end there for tonight. If anyone has any questions, you can always put them into the form, which we're gonna put on the website now to just say that you can watch the lecture and we can answer any of those at in two weeks from now at our, our session two. And Dr. Griswold can respond to those and those responses can come directly from her if anything comes up. So thank you everyone for being here tonight. Thank you, Dr. Griswold for giving us this talk. My pleasure. And have a lovely Wednesday. Bye-bye. Okay, bye everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much.